This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joar. Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joar, and today is Tuesday, March 26, 2019. I'm here in Paris with Peter Godin of Huawei and with Daniel Sin of... What I work. Yeah, we're at work. <laughs> Peter, hi, good to see you again. Hi, Rem, how are you doing? Fantastic. Good. Um, Glad you can join us in Paris. Yeah, me too. So, you know, this is very exciting. We finally got to see the product, uh, P30 Pro, P30 Non-Pro, and we've got a bunch of questions for you. And we also want you to run us through some of the decisions and the features as uh, usual. Of course, as always. Fantastic. So, uh, let's get started. Um, the big takeaway for me is you're once again cranking imaging to 11, especially on the still side. And, you know, we've seen a very clear evolution, even across two product lines now of the P20 Pro last year, really kind of redefining what a camera phone could do due to the May 20 Pro that took a lot of that and kind of, I think it made it less focused on imaging in a way, because it's really a more holistic device. Um, and, and but still includes all of these things, right? I've That's been right. personally using it as my main camera to actually shoot photos of devices <laughs> for my my publication for the last, uh, since October, since I saw you in London. Well, I mean, this is the thing. So we're all about just producing the best products possible. With the Mate family, it's very much with squeezing in as much cutting edge technology, which does include, of course, advancements in, in camera technology. Um, but with the P series, it's very much focused on creating a tool that allows people the creativity that they want uh, from a photographic point of view. So yeah, so with the P thirty series, we've we've again gone to a, a next level entirely. And it feels like that to me. You know, it's interesting because when you say that, Daniel, I, I want your thoughts on this. Yeah. The Mate twenty, in my opinion, mm. is a more versatile camera system, but I still feel the P twenty is a slightly better in terms of imaging quality. I don't know what it is. I, I mean, they're very, very close, but if I had to nitpick, well, I would if, pick the P20 Pro probably. Even if we look at a scientific point of view when it comes to photography, and of course DxO, they scientifically test uh, camera systems to the nth degree. Um, even the Mate 20 Pro didn't outscore the P20 Pro. It matched it, um, but it didn't outscore. So we still had all the way from last year, the best camera system on the market with the P20 Pro. And I think was that this by is design, also, you think, or that was just, you know, because you introduced the new wide angle and removed the monochrome, it was a new set of challenges? Yeah, I think it was more a case of um, we're looking at photography from a holistic point of view, as you say, with the, the, the Mate. But with P, we're really looking to stretch photography on a creative on an aesthetic level. Yeah. Um, and therefore the camera setups really fine tuned for that. And we've done the same thing again with the, with the P30 series this time. Although what we've done in some ways is, is actually go back through the fundamentals of photography, of digital photography and, and question, well, why are we doing these things? Is this still the best way of doing things? And what can we do? What can we change actually that may give us a greater advantage for the consumer? in versatility not only of kind of shot that people can take but the environments in which they can photograph as well which is why of course this change now with our, our super spectrum sensor yeah so let's talk about that i i, I want to quick maybe go uh, a little higher level quickly run through what's what's on the device let's start with the pro we've got four cameras in the back Correct. now right like a quad camera system right so you have a full the, the new what is it called super spectrum full super spe spectrum super spectrum so sensor 40 megapixel okay. super spectrum sensor is the main camera system f01.6 f1.6 and there's some really interesting stuff going on we'll get dig into that yeah uh then you've got a new a new zoom lens we have it's still eight megapixels which was the quality we had previously but we've re-engineered the way that we're achieving the zoom so we've integrated a periscope zoom yeah, lens yeah. design, um, which allows us that extra magnification. Right. So in the P30 Pro, for example, we can achieve five times optical zoom. Uh -huh. um, but we know we've got information in the camera sensor of the 40 megapixel, which can augment that image. Right. So we can then achieve a 10 times lossless or hybrid zoom. Right. 
Another thing that we didn't touch on, and I, and I want to go dig about dig into that a little more when we talk about the super spectrum, is that you added OIS to the main lens. Correct. Only on the P30 Pro. Only on the P30 Pro. And I have some questions around that. And then the third lens that's significant on, well, they're all significant, but the, to me, very significant, is you have removed the monochrome from the P20 Pro and added a wide angle, just like you did on the May 20 Pro, yeah. but this wide angle is an even better. It's a bigger pixel count now but it's also a completely new sensor right correct so 20 megapixel ultra wide mm -hmm. angle so the angles are slightly wider um we've got uh, a better aperture size as well in comparison mm -hmm. so you've got a much although we've, we've kind of introduced that versatility of camera systems so with the mate 20 what we're looking at is you know if you're equating it to a dslr you have the opportunity of snapping on and off different lenses yeah for your different focal lengths here we built a camera system where actually your versatility of focal length was built into the camera system in itself. We didn't need to carry any other lenses. It's all sitting within that one device. So here we've just improved that a little bit more. So you right. still got that ultra wide angle lens that, mm -hmm. that shoots really epic images. Yep. Uh, and then all the way through to that telephoto lens, which makes things that are very far away now, very far away, yep. feel and look much, much closer. Uh, Daniel, do you know Ben Sin? I mean, unrelated, I know, but uh, he lives in Hong Kong. He's a tech <laughs> journalist. And he tweeted recently, we had a whole, maybe it was Twitter, Facebook, I think it was Facebook. We had a whole discussion about how the wide angle lens yep. is really the one to have if you have a second lens or a Definitely. third lens. Definitely. And that we, I think a lot of us journalists, I can't speak for everyone, but mm. well, you probably agree with me that if you're given two lenses, one is a regular, it's optimized for like low line, best case scenario of everything. Yep. The second lens you want after that is not a tele, it's a wide angle, ultra wide angle. I, I agree. Yeah. I, I would be on the same boat on that. Okay. So because of that, it's been really magical to see this on the May 20 Pro and now carry on the, th the P30 Pro, in my opinion. There's a fourth camera on the P30 Pro and there that's is. a time of flight, Correct. which is going to be used for depth sensing, which is really critical. Um, Quickly going over the difference between the P30 series, the P30 drops the time of flight, has a, a 16 megapixel wide angle sensor instead Correct. of a 20, and then loses OIS on the main sensor. And the optical zoom is very similar to last year's P20 Pro. It's three times optical so Z stack. Mate 20 yeah? Pro. Oh, three sorry, times, Mate 20 Pro. Mate 20 Pro, three times optical zoom. Correct. Correct. So that's kind of the lay of the land. So, uh, tell us about that super spectrum because this blows my mind. Like, how does it work? Like, I was wondering how you do blues now, because do you do you add the yellows? I'm uh, sorry, how you do uh, greens? Do you add the yellows and the blues to get green? So, so this is the thing. Um, the fundamental change that we're making with this sensor is huge, and we're really in the unique position that nobody else can do this because there are so many steps in the chain to make this happen. Even from re-engineering the algorithms that are processed by the digital image signal processor, there's so many steps along the way to make this actually happen. Um, what we've done is we've taken the, the, the same technology that was being used from the inception of digital photography. So RGB sensor, mm -hmm. so red, green, blue. Actually, in, in theory, it should even be red, green, green, blue. Correct. Yes, because for every pixel sensor, yeah. you have one element which is absorbing red light one element which is absorbing blue light, but then two blocks which are absorbing green light. Right. Uh, is it because eyes are more sensitive to green light? Is that what it is? I can't remember. There's a reason there. I, I can't remember. It's something we'll, like we'll that. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, the Leica that, would know. Leica and Leica know. is your partner in this. Correct. Exactly. And, uh, anybody These who guys listens, are the experts. Anybody who listens to this show should know that by now. But, but you know, obviously, so before we get into the details on this yellow versus green pixel thing, that, that's where we're going. Um, is this a collab? Was it purely a collaboration? Was it something came from Leica uh, suggested, or was it something came from a Huawei suggestion? As you well know, it's, I mean, it's hard to tell yeah. the difference between <laughs> the two. The teams work so closely together. The collaboration is so tight knit that um, the reason we call it a Leica quad camera system is because it is co engineered between us and Leica. There's expertise in both elements on both sides of that business. Um, that, that really come together and create some amazing things. Uh, so it's difficult to say exactly who came up with this idea, whether it was Leica, whether it was, uh, whether it was us. But um, if you look at it, digital photography has been done the same way since it began. Even Leica have continued to do it the same mm -hmm. way. Um, 
what we've changed is actually the color of those green light absorbing elements into yellow. So instead of taking green light from the light spectrum that, that is around us, um, the sensor is designed to take yellow light. Mm -hmm. What this does for us is it then not only takes green light, but also red light as well. Ah. So part of that light spectrum that you see within yellow, so it means that we get the green light still absorbed in, but we get additional red light information as well. So what we're doing is we're taking that extra light and it's over 40% more light that we can absorb. Yeah, and that's the, the light idea, right? I mean, if you, I think uh, Arne, your colleague, yeah. showed us at, in San Francisco when we got briefed last week, a, a yellow transparency paper versus a green transparency paper on a white background, the same amount of light, yeah. ambient light. Yeah. And we could clearly see that more, more, you know, more stuff was coming through the yellow than the green to our eyes. Because you have a greater width of light spectrum being absorbed by yellow light. So we still have to recompile all yeah, of that so that's information. That's the thing that I'm kind of blown back away by. Into an I, I, RGB as an format. engineer, I'm thinking about the math that goes on back yeah. there, and I'm like, whoa, how did you do that? That's by reinventing, re engineering all of those algorithms that are processed by the digital image signaling processor, which is why we're in such a unique position. Um, because any other company trying to do this would have to work with another third party to get them yeah. to do because, of course, you know, we're lucky enough that, that our DSIPs, DSIPs are part of the Kirin 980 chipset, which right. is something so which is produced control that by us. As well. yeah, so we control that already. Yeah. And we can spend all of that time, all of that engineering investment to actually rethink the whole camera system in this way. What it does for us is that move in absorbing 40% more light, plus a dramatic increase with our light sensitivity. So now our ISO levels are at 409,600. Plus that wider f1.6 aperture means the amount of light that we're able to absorb into the light sensor, so the camera yeah, sensor. Yeah, that's great. Practically turning This is what you used to have day. on the monochrome sensor before. You went to 1.8 for a, a while A much there. wider yeah, dynamic it's range, being able to take a huge more Are you amount. still using a quad bio filter but with yellow instead of green then i believe so okay so it's still that that same format with the four pixel elements but it's green it's yellow rather than green right so that's what i thought so so dan you're director of photography <laughs> extraordinaire for board at work you live your life by shooting video mostly but yeah. i know you're pretty big stills photographer what's your what's your thoughts and takeaway on this on this new super spectrum sensor I mean, for the most part, I'm just excited to see a lot better low light photography in phones. I feel like that's where it struggles a lot in the mobile world. So that's where like, I'm just glad that I'm hearing all about this new yellow technology, where it's like, oh, like anybody can get a good low light um, photo. So yeah. And the important thing here is actually, because the sensor has that new technology built in, it's not only still photography that reaps the benefit of Video, this low light right. capability, uh -huh. but also moving image as well. Mm -hmm. So recording video in low light environments will also benefit from this brand new technology. So you're kind of switching both sides. So still photography will be improved because not only are we producing a versatile system that allows you different focal lengths, but now we're extending the environments in which you can photograph and still get really, really good photos. Not just, yeah, I can see what's happening there. It's a little bit dark. It's a little bit, you know, exposure is not great. But actual photos that you can clearly see color, shape, form, as if it would be taken in natural daylight. Absolutely. I, I saw some samples. Uh, we're going to get devices pretty soon, I'm sure. So we'll let you know, of course, dear listeners, <laughs> once we get our hands on. But what I've seen so far is really, really impressive. Um, I think for low light, that main sensor is going to be really killer. What I'm curious about is there are some really great pluses and some potential small minuses to that new zoom sensor. I mean, the telescopic design, uh, sorry, the periscopic, periscopic whatever yeah. design is, is I think, you know, been done on point shoot cameras for years uh, with a variable zoom, of course. I like that you guys went fixed because it's like one solid manufacturable sealed design that is probably very shockproof because of it. So that removes a whole variable, uh, you know. It's still optically stabilized. And it's optically it still has stabilized, OS of course. Um, and you get a new, more sensitive 8 uh, megapixel sensor. Correct. Do you know the pixel sizes on all three of these sensors, by the way? I, I 
You I'm not going to okay. divulge that no just problem. yet. Just curious. But but we will get that for you. So my biggest concern, I'm super excited about the five times Zoom um, because I I've, I use it all the time on the three times on the Mate 20 Pro and the P20 Pro. Um, what I'm really excited about is the up to 10 times hybrid zoom Correct. and 50 times digital zoom. And I've seen some results, again, some, some samples and I'm like, holy crap balls. But my concern is on the, on the, on the flip side, I use my P20 Pro and my Mate20 Pro a lot for uh, device photography and often in really poor light, like this, uh, this uh, beautiful theater we're in right now. And the struggle is with low light because of the f-stop. So, you know, 2.4 on the three times zoom was what it was. Now we're at 3.4 f-stop on the five times zoom. Um, is there any, being, any compensation in the quality of the sensor to kind of balance that out somehow? Well, this is the advantage of going hybrid because not only are you using information then from the zoom camera, but it's being augmented by information from that 40 megapixel main camera right. sensor for which you obviously have that amazing light, low light capability. So you can so even when right. you're zooming, even if you guess if you go sort of like six seven, if you go past that five time zoom, actually you're getting all of that information from the main sensor as well. So even in low light, you will start to see this this amazing image still there. Um, adding to that the optical stabilization, of course, on plus both. Are you synchronizing it? Like how? That's magic. Nobody's done this before. It's a, it's a good idea. I, I, I don't know. This is I, honestly I, I, the first I thing I thought about. Either. Nobody has done shooting on multiple lenses simultaneously and synchronizing the OI. What we are doing is using AI stabilization of as well. And so even though they're optically stabilized, we're also augmenting that again, adding the extra stability from the AI capabilities. So that you get the magical, best of both worlds. By the way. I mean, last year when you guys introduced that on the P twenty Pro, I always remember the first time I took a shot. It was in San Francisco at Race Point's office, looking across the street, and I remember when it locked in. You know, like yes. that. It takes a fraction of a second to lock in, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is going to change everything." And then the night mode, of course, it enables that incredible night mode. And do you remember also doing those zoom photos? And not only would it lock in, but if, for example, you were taking a picture of a poster from a long way away. The camera would recognize text because right. the AI would kick in and say, this is text. Yeah. So again, you get that extra sharpening and again, that optimization for what the camera sees and understands, mm -hmm. even at things which are really, really far away. So this shooting, this adding uh, low light information from the main sensor, that was already done on P20 Pro as well, correct? Or is this a new thing for the P30 we Pro? We were always with that higher megapixel sensor and the, the zoom when we put that, that in, we were then adding together to do the hybrid. This is, of course, because back then it was like three times optical mm -hmm. and five times hybrid. Correct. Now we're going to the level of hybrid zoom, which nearly every other smartphone camera on the market has as digital zoom. Correct. So they're manipulating the pixels. You're losing quality For of sure, image yeah. to get to that zoom level. Here, we're already at that 10 times hybrid zoom without any degradation in quality whatsoever and can reach out as five times past that so 50 times digital zoom and still using ai to recognize things like text and sharpen those so you get amazing photos even from very very far away right so that, the next question i have for you is and again sorry that's also again something which is reflected in video image as well as still image mm -hmm. slightly different so we go 10 times optical zoom and then only 15 times for the digital zoom with video right but still, you're able to shoot something much, much further away than you ever could before and still get a really high quality image. Yeah, that's great. Um, so as you probably saw, MWC Oppo showed off a prototype of a 10 times optical periscope, uh, telescope, whatever, zoom. Um, I'm not re I wasn't at that briefing. I don't know if it was. Maybe you were, Daniel. I wasn't, Whether it was a variable zoom, like where they move the lenses inside to do uh, or what. Um, and I kind of have an answer for this, but I kind of want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Obviously, people are very impressed at time, 10 times optical. You obviously can achieve this with a hybrid zoom without, in a way, sacrificing the, 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 the range between two times, three times, et cetera, right? Because that's the biggest challenge, I think, once you can put huge tele lenses on a phone, is that you lose the ability to do that, that sweet spot or maybe two times or three times, right? Um, and so... On the Mate 20 Pro and the P20 Pro, you had three times optical. So three times was the native resolution, basically. 
And then you could hybrid zoom bigger than that, and you, f you fell back to the main sensor, which is really large, for the two times, and it was fine. How are you guys handling the, if I want to zoom three times or two times on the P30 Pro? So, I mean, to be honest, I, I haven't heard much about the, the Oppo stuff. No, of we're course We're too no. busy concentrating on what, what, we're, what we're doing. But there are a couple of things that we obviously have that nobody else does, which is the AI system. Right. So that really helps us a lot with this. Um, but for us, the, the UI is very, very simple. So you'll start off at a one-time zoom, uh -huh. and you can either step back and go ultra wide angle with just like tapping the, the little button icon beneath the one time zoom. Or again, you can then just go directly to five times zoom or 10 times zoom. Right. In between, you, you've got a choice of a sliding bar along the side that you can actually uh, slide up your, your choice of, of zoom or you can pinch to zoom. So it's really, really easy. But we do give you those major steps really simply. So just at a right. touch of a button, you can go directly from one time to five times zoom. And then from five times to ten times zoom. Great. Um, tell us about a little bit about that ultra wide angle. It still has autofocus, which I thought was a brilliant move on your part on the May twenty Pro because it lets you do macro photography. It makes, yeah, it lets us do amazing macro photography. Get really, really close up and detailed. So that's still objects. the case. Yes. Yes, obviously. still the case. And you don't two, need two point five centimeters away from an object and still get real clear, crisp. You don't need pictures. to stabilize that lens because you have AI stabilization for that. If you ever need to stabilize a ultra wide angle anyway, right? And yeah, so it's, it's fine. It's fine. So, okay. Actually, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting some of the things that we, we try and do. Um, uh, I've been involved in, in one of uh, an amazing project which we're working on for uh, maximizing our AI capability called Track AI. Uh -huh. We've been working with a group of doctors that are developing a system using uh, Huawei hardware. Um, and some AI machine learned based algorithm based software, which can better diagnose uh, visual impairedness in, in young children or, or, or people who don't necessarily have the motor functions to control their sight in, in a way um, that can be measured accurately by a normal doctor. Um, and we were working with them and, and as part of the process, we were looking at photographing really high resolution images of people's eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was talking to the guys about the capabilities of our phone. And when I said, you know, we can even get as close up to two and a half inches away from an object, two and a half centimeters away from an object and still get a clear, crisp focus. A little light bulb went off in their head. They said, oh, well, a human eyeball that has a, a dimension of about two centimeters. I wonder, can you actually take a photo of the retina of the back of an eyeball? Because you can get so course, close up right. detailed yeah. to an eye. Um, so one of the doctors, they, they have this special drops, which they put in, which of course, you know, uh, opens up the, the dilates, they, your, dilates pupil, your, yeah. your, your, your pupil. So you can try and get in um, for us to try and see <laughs> whether we P30 could. P30 Pro exactly. in there? It, it was a P30 Pro right up Cyborg. close against the eyeball. Unfortunately, with human engineering, biology, it means that we've got this, this lens that sits in front of everything. That the, the camera was focusing on that. We couldn't actually get deep inside. Oh, yeah. But, but that, that two and a half centimeters, you can get really close up detailed images. That's pretty fantastic. So I got some amazing eyeball pictures, I can tell you with that. So I want to step back a bit. We've talked a lot about imaging, and I appreciate that. I want to ask you, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the differences between the P30 Pro and the P30, just in general. Obviously, there are different price points. We don't know what those prices are quite yet, but... Um, I'm curious, like, if you were to um, kind of pick the the ideal customer for these two products, who would they be? What you know, because there are some clear differences. After the size and like, screen size and battery size are the biggest differences that are obvious. But then there's things like a headphone jack on the P30, no headphone jack P30 Pro. You got stereo speakers on the P30, no stereo speaker on the P30 Pro because you got this embedded in display speaker, which is really interesting. Um, this is off the top of my head just now. But, uh, of course, the slight differences in camera systems we talked about. Yep. So, so where do you, how do you place these two, these two products? Um, so P30 Pro, obviously, that's always the upper level. Right. That, that's for that's the, your flagship, the kind of, right? I mean, exactly. ultimately, that, that is when you, across all when the lines looking, at this point. Yeah. Well, obviously, the families, the two different families have different target audiences. But for the P30 audience, the Pro is obviously the big top right. benchmark. Um, that's the tool that if you are really serious at photography, you really want to unleash your creativity uh, that you go for. Um, 
Of course, it's slightly more expensive than the P30 is. Mm -hmm. um, but there is also an audience that doesn't necessarily want all of the bells and whistles which goes with the Pro. So, for example, uh, one of the things that you didn't mention uh, around um, the P30 Pro, P30 variances yeah. is, is things like wireless charging. Wireless charging, yeah. It, it's so not that comes with the P30. P30 Pro, but it's not built into the P30. Correct. And it's reversible, so a, right? Like you saw yeah, that reverse exactly. wireless. Again, yeah. it's reverse wireless charging, which we were the first to launch back last year with the Mate and 20 look, Pro. look, everybody's copying you now. Jeez. It's always nice to know when you know, you're doing something right, huh? <laughs> it, it is. It is. I mean, we spend a long time on, on and a lot of money on research and development and come up with some amazing ideas. But all of those are actually very consumer insight based. So you can understand why then people are starting to replicate it because they're actually seeing resonance with consumers with the things that we're doing. Um, but then there is an audience, for example, the P30 audience who, you know, don't want to necessarily have to pay for a feature that they won't potentially use right. wireless charging I mean, honestly and, and we can create a, a little bit of a um, you'll, you'll notice of course this time around with a p30 we're still using a 40 megapixel main sensor i mean that's what i'm so saying like it's if not that we're at, degrading the photographic capability significantly if you look at the p30 but there are other elements that people were more happily sacrificed for a little bit more of a portable price if you look it. at the p30 on paper right now in terms of camera system it is improved in its entirety over the Mate 20 Pro. Think about yeah. this for a second. It's very similar camera yeah. system to the, the Mate 20 Pro. Correct. Which is obviously the, the preceding flagship that's right. you know, so, as good a camera system as the P20 was. Exactly. And so it's, it's pretty remarkable that this year's P30 is essentially an improvement over last year's Mate 20 Pro, yeah. uh, in, mostly in the sensor quality and that, that super spectrum sensor, which I assume Correct. is on both phones. Yeah? It is. So that, I think, to me, is, is kind of a big piece of news. Also, this year, you have uh, OLEDs on both. Last Correct. year, you had uh, uh, LCD on the cheaper device. And uh, yeah, I think it's interesting to me because I think a lot of people are going to pick the P30 simply because of budget or whatever. And they're certainly not going to feel, you know, quite as, uh, you know, a loss. In, 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 in fact, they were getting a gain over what you just sold as the highest end just Correct. six months ago. So, so they, they will never be disappointed with the photographic capability they get from the P30. You get advancements with the P30 Pro that, that you know, outstrip the P30, but it's never going to be a disappointment because, as you say, it's, it's one of the systems which is designed to, you know, as good as what was preceding the Alpha. That's like amazing. Uh, one last question on this before we move on to whatever else is going on in the news uh, right now um, is the question about um, the no wires on the main sensor on the P30. Was that more of a cost thing or just you felt that, you know, only the, the super picky imaging crazy people like me and Daniel <laughs> would really want that? and need that, um, I'm just kind of curious. Ultimately, because we have the AI image stabilization that runs on both the P30 and the P30 Pro, even if you've, you're using the P30, you won't really see that difference unless you are guys like yourself, <laughs> where, where you go into that minutia detail that you know, really is where the advantage of having an optically stabilized main sensor will come from. The other element is in terms of that zoom functionality as well, because we're we're merging that together to get that hybrid zoom as a significant level at you know, 10 times. The optical stabilization of that main sensor helps a little For bit sure, as yeah. well. So because we don't quite deliver the same level of zoom capability as with the P30 compared to the P30 Pro, it's not so much of a requirement. Daniel, have you noticed something interesting that's been happening as cameras in the last three, four years is that for a long time, we had a lot of high-end phones had OIS. Right. And only OIS, no AI, no, and if they had digital, see, it was, it was janky. Mm. Uh, and then we moved to a whole generation of phones that dropped the OIS in favor of some sort of AI stabilization or some sort of AI uh, image stacking. Um, you know, the, the Pixel and, and Nexus phones were really, really doing that. They went from OIS to no OIS and they took really great photos. And, you know, you guys did that too. You went from dual OIS on I think the Mate 10 Pro and the, the, the P10 Pro before that, uh, and then, you know, P10 Plus back then. A and then, you know, you dropped it for the P20 Pro, and now it's coming back on the P30 Pro, and we've seen it come back on the Pixel 2, Pixel 2, X Pixel, Pixel 3, and Pixel 3 XL. It's interesting to me that I think there was a computational challenge there, because combining OIS 
with an AI system, they, they, you know, they could cancel each other out and fight each other in some way. So you actually have to engineer the system to, to make it work. And I think it's more difficult, which is why it's taken so long for the OIS to come back on those main sensors. And I think that's my theory, but I don't know what you think. I, I do agree because a lot of people um, ask about if I can turn off the AIS. Yeah, 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 because if they're using a gimbal, which is oh, technically yeah. optical. So it's like they see it fighting each other. They see this weird warping issue because like they would want to turn it off um, AIS when they want to use something like a gimbal that's optical. So it's, it's just like a... It's definitely a challenge, yeah, right? The, uh, you can see it. You can physically see they're fighting each other in, in terms of image. I'm just shooting. excited. I mean, I see you shoot with a gimbal. Do you think that with this P30 Pro, you're finally going to be able to shoot video without a gimbal? Um, Daniel, what is the verdict? What do you think? Oh, I would have to... It's hard. I, I feel like we're almost there. We're like okay. almost there. Maybe maybe next two years. <laughs> maybe next two years, I, I would say. To Fantastic. be safe. Yeah. Well, listen, Peter, thanks so much for being on the show. Um, you're welcome. It's always any a pleasure, final Mary. thoughts on what people should know about these fabulous two devices you just launched today? I think it's really very clear we're producing tools for people to really tap into their creativity, to allow them to express not only still image photography, but also now videography. Because some of the stuff we've, we haven't talked about yet is, is things like the, the dual video mode yeah, feature. Yeah, that's fun. Four cameras on the back of uh, P30 Pro. But there's enough of them for us to let you have access to two of them at the same time <laughs> in recording video. And enough so, processing power to And do enough it. processing power with the Kirin 980 as well to, to allow you to have uh, a view on one side of the page with the ultra wide angle. And, and on the second side, if you want to zoom in and closer, a good example is if you're a, a sports event, you want to see you know, the wide angle, the full game going on, but then you also want to get close in on the action. Well, you can do that because the other side of the screen, you're then able to zoom in with the main camera sensor. So you're the director, basically. You can see all you the preview, produce, like in the studio, exactly. in, the, in the truck in the back, you know, at the sport event. And you're like, tap, I want this now. Exactly. So it's really tapping into different versions of people's creativity and allowing you, you know, at an instant press of your shutter button to take amazing photos um, that look beautiful, that you can be proud of to share straight away, um, to create really innovative intriguing videos with looking at different perspectives of the same scene simultaneously mm -hmm. um, using ai for example again with our ai color portrait mode using those features to give you creative effects that you can use so it's really just a, such a powerful tool to put in people's fingertips and it's the tool that they carry with them on a daily Every basis day. yeah. and this is the important thing this is why it's so important for us because uh actually you know the best camera is the one that you have with you all yep, the time absolutely. and we will also say that also knows more about you as well and what you like to photograph because of the ai and lets capabilities. you share i mean that's and me, lets you share that's instantly. why i started using phones for, i got into photography in the mid 2000s using the very bad at the time camera phones because i really wanted to share i wanted to be able to be a digital creator yeah. you know so now you've got a versatile system that allows you different focal lengths super wide close up you know really good high resolution and you know very very long way away photography um that allows you to take photos in a much wider array of scenarios you know darker lights even brighter lights using ai again to to help us with hdr so even if you're taking a photo of a really bright environment you want to have somebody you know, clearly balancedly lit in front of that bright environment so you've got these perfect hdr photos that mm. will just have a perfect exposure balance across all elements that are in that photo so it's such a versatile tool that's in your hands on a daily basis well again thanks peter really appreciate you being on the Thank show you, Miriam. always a pleasure absolutely and we'll have you on again i'm sure in the future so daniel yes. now yes i want to hear what you think of this p30 pro p30 now you can speak peter's not on here you're good to go <laughs> okay um, I mean, honestly, what, you're, you're a videographer. You yep. are a pro at video, but I know you love doing photography as a hobby. So what do you think? Um, to be honest, like in Barcelona, M MWC, um, I bought a lot of other phones with me. And the one I pulled out the most was the Mate 20. Funny that. Me too. Yeah. If you look at almost everything I posted from MWC, whether mostly a lot of my product shots were all on, P on Mate 20 Pro. 
Yeah, all, all, like on, on my Instagram, all my posts, even the stories, they were all on the May 20. I took a few with the Pixel. You know, sometimes like, you know, I Qualcomm stuff. I didn't want to shoot with a Huawei phone. I felt like it maybe a little bit politically charged there. But <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that, uh, I mean, I love my Pixel 3 XL. It's my main phone still. Um, it's still hard for me to put my main SIM in, in, the, in the Huawei phone simply because of the software. I mean, it's I okay with a good launcher. I'm fine, but I just always have challenges around that. But I mean, okay. So I know you bought a Galaxy uh, S10e recently. Mm. I, with your own money, as your, <laughs> I guess your main phone. No, or just to no, play with. I, to actually to play, play with. with. Okay, it's yeah. So, so I want to kind of, you know, we've we've heard the things on the P30. What is the thing that gets you most most excited about the P30 Pro? P30 Pro. Um, is that new periscope zoom okay like i'm not a zoom guy myself i barely touch the zoom but since this is a new thing and i've used it a couple of times i would i would say i would use it more often but not like i would with the ultra wide okay yeah the ultra wide is a killer oh, and yeah. i'm so glad samsung did the right thing by putting the ultra wide oh, yes. only as a second lens yes, on the, yes. the s10e and we'll talk about that in a sec what about the P, p30 do you think that you know are you i mean obviously you and i would Probably we'll probably get review units and we'll be able to get the pro and use that. But I I feel like there's a lot of freaking value there, especially if this mm -hmm. undercuts the big guy by two hundred bucks, right? Or something like it did last year. I I feel like if if you're a guy like me who does not really zoom that often, um, I think the P thirty would. I mean, you still, still have be, a killer zoom yeah, on it. You yeah, but I mean, you you barely touch it anyway. So like, why do you really need to pay an extra amount? just to get that new periscope zoom which you know you're not going to use yeah. so yeah. the interesting thing is to see how, what they're going to do with that time of flight camera i mean a lot oh, of yeah. films have time of flight now you know oppo r17 or i think that's the one i have that has a time of flight in the back the uh the, the honor view 20 has a time of flight in the back but they don't seem to be using it for much more than like ai games and stuff mm -hmm. and i'm kind of wanting to see it being used for refocusing right. type of yeah. stuff and yeah. and like uh you know I don't know other stuff. It, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. But I like that more and more devices are adding time of flight, front and back, or front or back, right? Like the G8 from LG and and et cetera, et cetera. So um, that being said, I'm I'm stoked about the P30 Pro simply because I, as a creative person who loves photography, particularly still photography, uh -huh. you know, video is always. Uh, I mean, I, I I shoot videos, but I'm not <laughs> in nearly remotely as professional as you and uh you know and at a long <laughs> yeah. R for sure so i feel like i don't care too much about that i mean if it's great awesome i'll use it from time to time but the, the imaging stuff has really got me i mean this is insane that they went to f1.6 on that main sensor is a huge thing uh that super spectrum sensor will be really interesting to see mm -hmm. how much better that is oh yeah and then of course the periscope uh zoom but that wide angle intrigues me at 20 a 20 megapixel i wonder if they kept the sensor, the pixel size, I think it was one micron or 1.1 micron last time. If they kept that or they, and they just got a physically bigger sensor, because that means then, you know, more, more well, data to play yeah, with. Well, yeah. It'd be really interesting to find out. Uh, obviously, we don't know the, some of the details yet. We're here in Paris. We're here another couple of days. So <laughs> yeah. those of you who are going to listen to next week's show, that is my way of plugging you in so you stay tuned, listeners. Uh, well, I'm probably going to have somebody like, uh, if I can, like somebody who's really into photography, like Steve Litchfield or somebody on, if I can, because I think it's going to be really important to know what uh, what this camera can do, especially once right. we've played with it. Maybe I'll wait a few weeks until we all play with it a little bit. But go back to the Galaxy for a second. I finally got I, this. This is actually news for the listeners. Ah. I've struggled with this. This is a long ongoing and I cannot be nice about it because it's really annoying me. Mm -hmm. I did not go to the Samsung event in San Francisco, even though I live in San Francisco, because I was already in Barcelona. I couldn't change my flights, at least not without spending thousands of dollars on changes. So I decided to forego the event. And of course, because that did not get a review in it at the event. And Samsung still does not have review units. How that is possible, <laughs> I do not understand a company that size not able to give me a review unit. Well, it's three weeks in now, three, four weeks almost. Yeah, almost. So. Thankfully, and I want to thank them so hard right now, the folks at T-Mobile heard my plight and said, hey, Miriam, we can send you one. And so I said, please do. It's locked, unfortunately, but I'm a T-Mobile customer. So obviously this is nice. They also gave me a SIM card. Mm 
which roams here in France for free, which is also nice. Thank you, thank you, T-Mobile. So I've got the the blue, uh, what is it called? Uh, it's a lighter blue. Oh, yeah, I have the same one. Yeah, um, so I don't know what it's called. Pearlish blue prism, or prism. Blue prism. Or something. prism. Something. Thank you, right. prism blue. Prism blue, pearlish blue, light blue, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, and uh, it's awesome. I am really impressed with this phone. I feel like, you know, I mean, I knew this, but it's it's, it's hard to talk about it unless you actually use one. Right. For more than five minutes. And I've used a few of my Many media phones. friends' Galaxy S10s that they got at the event, but I haven't really had a chance to like spend a few days with one. And now that I have, I can say that I'm really very impressed with the camera systems, actually. Yeah, I, f I feel like they're really well-rounded for a phone. Yeah. For, for cam a phone in general and camera, all, all well-rounded, I would say. So we talked about how we love the ultra wide. Yes. Is that why you went for the the 10e then? Yes, because like I mentioned, it's, I don't really use yeah. telephoto, so they included the zoom and the regular. Like that's and all for I that need. price, you know. For that, yeah. I mean, I honestly think. Look, the reality is, you and I are tech journalists. We get access to these weird phones. Um, you know, my audience. I have a lot of listeners in India. I have a lot of YouTube viewers in Asia, and so obviously, I try to get phones from all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. Even though I'm based in the US, I kind of think of myself as a very global publication. But the reality is, the average person in the US is going to walk into a store and probably buy an iPhone if they've been an iPhone user, yep. and good chance they're going to buy a Galaxy of some kind if they're an Android user, right? Yeah. So. To me, it becomes a, you have to look at them side by side. And we all know that a lot of Americans walk into a store and buy a flagship because they can get in on installment payments, right? And I consider the 10E still a flagship because it still falls, a, it's, a, it's a Galaxy S, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to, th what are your thoughts on this? You're a video guy, so iPhone makes the best video, has the best video quality, right? So put that on one hand and balance it out with, I think for the same price as an iPhone XR, which is my right. favorite iPhone. Which is the one I used to, the XR. The, S, the, the Galaxy S10e, right. like, to me, it's a no-brainer you pick the Galaxy S10e, right? You get the wide-angle lens. I agree. So much more tech. You get a headphone jack. The value you pay for for the and, Samsung. And I get that people have invested in the, the iMessage and all right, that. Right, yeah. But, but, but we're talking about photography on this show and about video. You're a videographer. You're a pro videographer. You know that the iPhone XR is going to take better video than, the, by, marginally, than the, the Galaxy yeah, S10. Yeah, it's, it's not right? by much, but it's so just what, a little bit. So what do you do? Seven fifty bucks to spend. What do you <sighs> do, Daniel? <laughs> it's it's hard. I if if it was like like I said, the the, the Samsung S10, you, you get so much more value with what you pay for. But if you're just a video guy, oh man, it's it's really hard because like you you also want to do a lot more things especially using that the ultra wide angle lens yeah. so i think the ultra wide is is a huge reason and the headphone jack and is a huge reason to get yeah, that super steady mode oh yeah yeah that's that's a winner for um a lot of um and there's wireless sports. charging right oh yeah and wireless charging well i mean well, the 10r has wireless do, charging but the, not the reverse wireless charging correct it doesn't they don't you're right exactly i mean look i think i think that um I'm glad I got the the S10. Finally, I can talk about it. I, I have an S10 Plus, uh, so it has that oval cutout in the front. Honestly, uh, sure, here's another question. This is this is one's more polarizing than the uh, than the questions about uh, you know a wide angle right. versus tele um, notch or punch a oh, hole punch. Hole punch, definitely. Uh, yeah, me too. Hole, hole punch, High man. five. Hole punch. Look, I feel like. Uh, you know that video that Marquez did mm -hmm. where he had the, the little hole cut out, like he put a fake hole in a concrete pillar behind him. Yeah. And he started talking about how you get used to the cut out. And then he pointed out, he's like, over there, did you see that? <laughs> you, you, filled that you filled that concrete in with your brain. And I'm like, oh my God, I totally did. And I think that's the thing. It's like just having that tiny little rim um, of, of screen around that even oval, which is much bigger than on my Honor View 20, I have a, just a hole, mm. or like on a Galaxy S10e, like yours. Yeah. It's like, you, it disappears. I don't even notice. I think of it as a couple of more icons in my notification tray, honestly, <laughs> yeah. is kind of how I think about it. But I don't understand people who feel that the notch is a better solution. I, I, I It takes so much more real estate away. I mean, even a teardrop notch to me is almost as big as the oval for the Galaxy S10. Right. But I feel like the notch is just there, whereas 
it, it's just like when when you're watching content you know it's the the hole punch is in the corner so like it's you don't better, really yeah. look you, you look in the middle of the screen you don't look in the and corner you fill in anyway you fill yeah in. whereas you know the the your line of sight you can still see the notch whether it's a teardrop or like a huge notch like the, the iphones like that thing is just massive another thing I, we didn't talk about when peter was here about the p30 and p30 pro is that they have third generation in display optical fingerprint readers. Oh yeah. Um, and the Galaxy, as we know, uh, at least the 10 and 10 Plus have an in display ultrasonic infra- uh, fingerprint uh, scanner uh, sensor. And so to me, I have to say, this is again my first time really being able to use it for multiple days. I have zero, I think, oh, I shouldn't say zero. I've had one failure out of probably a hundred with the fingerprint reader on the Galaxy S10 Plus. Now, I don't have a screen protector. I removed the native screen protector. I don't know if that makes any difference, but I'm blown away how much better it is than the OnePlus 6T, Oppo R17, even Mate 20 Pro, which I don't think is very reliable. I would say of all of them, the Mate 20 Pro is the best one that I have, but it's at least still one third of my attempts fail. Whereas on the OnePlus 6T, half of my attempts, it's so frustrating. Um, So the P30 and P30 Pro have a third gen optical in display. Now, I didn't try them here yet, uh, uh, but have you? And what's your thoughts on that? Um, It's it's fast. I I would say it's really fast. Is it reliable though? Uh, I I didn't test it as much. I I did I did do a little testing like beside the um, S10 Plus, and it it, I think it looks faster on the um, P P30 Pro. To me, it's, speed is important. I do have to admit that my Galaxy S10 is a little slower than, of course, a, a normal back-mounted fingerprint a capacitive sensor. But I feel like speed is, is important. I would love the Galaxy to be faster. But my biggest gripe, honestly, on these so far has been, and of course, all the optical ones, has been the accuracy. Right. So I'm hoping that that's also fixed with the, the P30 and P30 Pro because that would be awesome <laughs> yeah yeah only time will tell with that we'll figure it out we'll, yeah we'll, we'll we'll have devices soon and we'll let you know um i think that there's some apple news i want to kind of touch on what's your what's your take in general on this whole they launched they, they kind of like trickled out their hardware last week and like totally like messed with our schedules yeah. and then this week they this big event uh yesterday what's your thoughts on that um, I mean, it's nice that we finally get some updates, but I, I feel like it sucks for us where it's like, you know, it would be nice to let us know, like heads up or like, it, it's just like, it's probably more workload on, on us. Cause like, damn, we got to update this and that and this every single day. Whereas when it's a huge event, like the 25th and we would all be prepared for this. Whereas the other announcements earlier in the week, like we didn't know about much about it either. So totally. Yeah, I feel like what they uh, what they announced uh, yesterday is not super exciting to me. But I mean, it's important. Like, like, I think it's clear that Apple needs to survive, and to to survive. I mean, they're not obviously. I I shouldn't say this. this is ridiculous. What I'm saying, Apple has so much money, they don't need to survive. <laughs> yeah. They're fine. I'm just saying, long term, their strategy should be focused more on services because I love their hardware and I'm a big fan of Mac OS. And I think iOS is a great OS too. I just feel it's a little too restrictive for me. Uh, watch OS is interesting too, but I feel like they know that they can rely on people. It's slowing down. People are going to spend, they don't want to spend a thousand dollars every year on a phone or, or more than that. They, they're going to wait two years, three, four years. And iPhones last a really long time. Oh, you know, yeah. There's a lot of yeah. people that I know, like my spouse has an iPhone SE that's a few years old now, and it's still ticking strongly. So I feel like services are the big deal. So they launched a credit card, they did a game subscription service. Uh, Apple Pay is going to work on public transit. There is like uh, uh, Apple News adding some LA Time and Wall Street Journal subscriptions. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a new subscription service. I mean, this is just some of the stuff they announced. And and I'm just kind of like, you know, I'm kind of waiting for the big news. <laughs> I'm right. still like, yeah. okay, so this is it. Uh, it's it's done. It's 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 fine. But like, where is the thing like you know like Google Stadia last week? I was at GDC. Scott Stein was my guest oh. from CNET. We talked about it because we were both in San Francisco. Do you have any thoughts on that? Are you a gamer? Um, I this year I really took a toll on gaming. Like I, I really like said no, no more gaming. Um, oh, I, I do game from here and there when I have downtime, but not as much as last year. So I'm, I'm trying to push myself away from gaming. So. 
Yeah. Do you think they can pull it off, this whole streaming thing, resume a game, right? Like, wherever, like, jumping into a game somebody else is playing, like, maybe a YouTuber is playing that you're, you're a fan. Like, say Anobong was playing a game live on YouTube and right. somebody could jump and compete against him. That, that's kind of what they're promising. I mean, it's kind of exciting. Do you think as a creator, I mean, as a group of creators, mm -hmm. that's something that you see, you know, you see yourselves you jumping into? Yeah, I mean, um, especially how they just stream it, right? They, 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 they do stream it, right, on your, um, on your screen and all that stuff. Like, it's pretty nice that you don't really need... Yeah, you like, can do it on any, basically. Hardware. It requires a, a smartphone, anything that runs Chrome or Chromecast, right? right? Yeah, so it's like, no one really needs to pay so much money on a gaming rig where you can just get, like, like this Mac, you know, this basic MacBook here, and just, like, I can play, like, a hardcore game on this this little machine here so yeah absolutely no i think it's it's uh it's interesting that uh you know obviously the the big vi the big news was the video announcement from apple that's you know pretty critical um but I, i think to me it's just like they're just doing what was inevitable right like it's it's like you you they needed to do something because if you know getting people to pay for subscriptions is really what you want in the long run that, i mean that's in a way you know like you and i were laughing earlier because of how much more we like google photos and oh, yeah. app, apple photos right <laughs> yeah. and i mean to me it's no contest you want google photos because it's well, it's cheaper or free it's depending on what quality you want to store you know it's available on multiple platforms which is a big deal that's, that's the best part um for me. and and more importantly it's like you know it's got all this ai search and of course you Yeah, it's, I suppose you give up some of your privacy because they can act, they have access to your photos for their AI, but I don't have a problem with that. I feel like I want the AI to be better at doing photos so that I yeah. can classify my photos better. Right. So I'm willing to give them that data, but you know, Apple charges for that. Uh, for, I, for, I think like, you get five gigs of storage yeah, in free. iCloud for free or and, something. And that fills and, up really quick. And you quick. run out like yeah. in two minutes. Yep. Um, and it's nice, you know, for, obviously their strategy is pretty smart because people have had to pay for extra storage. And, you know, once they're locked in, like, the, and they run out, you know, they're just going to spend the money. Oh, yeah. Right? A dollar in. a month or something right. for the first year, it's pretty cheap. So I get it. But I feel like, you know, I feel like Google's model is more interesting to me. Um, and maybe I'll change my mind. Maybe, you know, if, I mean, Facebook has done some really stupid stuff <laughs> and, and they're kind of on my, on my uh, uh, shit list, as it mm. were. But I think that uh, Google's still not quite that bad to me, so I'm I'm okay with it. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting. What other phones have you had a chance to play with recently that have really kind of like tickled your fancy in terms of imaging? Obviously, you had an iPhone XR. So I want to ask you this. This is actually an interesting thing. To me, part of the reason I like the XR better than the XS and XS Max is not just because it's cheaper and I feel like it gives you much more value, right? right? But I feel that you can do better portraits because it doesn't have the tele. It uses the main sensor, so you have a better f-stop, and it does better portraits in the dark. Uh, you also don't have to pull back as much because it doesn't true, use the zoom. So, so that's, have you experienced that? Is that one of the things you like better about it? Um, no, it's more, for me, any phone that I pick, I, I love battery life. That's why the XR like wins yeah, for me. Yeah, well, it's definitely the best, for sure. Yes. But in, in terms of like, like a portrait mode i would i would prefer the um s the the regular one the xs oh, really? yeah but not in low light try it you'll see it's much better in low oh, yeah. light than, I mean, than 10r yeah yeah in, in in that case but it's more of um uh i guess the way how you like the photography because if you really take a portrait mode on a 10r you that person will look a little bit distorted and skinnier um whereas if you take it with the xs it, it's like a nice yeah no i you know, see that like, yeah for sure But for me, it's the low light because you know how it is. You're you're going out with your friends. It's always right. like you're in a dark bar That's or something. Yeah. It's just yeah. like you struggle. It just seems to struggle in the 10s and 10s Max. I you know what? I just wish Apple, and this is totally not something Apple would do because Apple doesn't like giving the users uh, settings. Yep. But I would love to have a setting or maybe an automated thing where if it gets dark, as below a certain level, it doesn't use the tele anymore. It uses the main lens only right. for portraits. And it does just the computational stuff instead of using the data from the depth sensing. I, I don't know. I think it'd be really interesting. Um, and I'm not sure that Apple would ever do that. But hey. It's Apple. Yeah. So, you know, um, that's, uh, that's Apple. Yeah, for sure. Trying to think of other phones. Um, 
any phones that are upcoming now that the P30 and P30 Pro are out and about that you're excited about? Of course, OnePlus 7. I am. I, I feel like with OnePlus 7 or OnePlus, I just like, they, they never 100% fully satisfy me with their picture quality or even video quality. I mean, especially when I have like experience with Google, the Pixel, Google Pixel, Samsung and iPhones, like, you know, it's interesting because I feel the same way, but I've talked to people who have a lot of respect for and who are very, very imaging savvy, who feel that with the OnePlus 6T, OnePlus has kind of passed a, a bar and reached a level where they are really getting very good. For example, yeah, that, you know, that's true. You know yeah. Richard Lai of Engadget? Have you ever met him? I don't think so. He's the editor-in-chief of the Chinese version of Engadget. He's based in Hong Kong. I used to work with him when I was at Engadget. He's also a contributor to... Uh, the English version of the site. And uh, he reviewed the OnePlus 6T uh, for them. I reviewed the OnePlus 6T for Geekspin. Now, he reviewed it like just recently, like a month ago or something. So he took his time. I reviewed it back when it, about the first two or three weeks it came out. Um, and my takeaway was that the imaging is now finally good enough for me to recommend this phone. But with a caveat that it still didn't perform as well in low light as the competition. Uh, the night mode though does really help and it's actually pretty decent they have whatever they call it they have a special night mode uh, that's you know handheld and stabilizes and everything it stacks the photos but I feel like you know Richard made a point that I didn't think I didn't think about until he mentioned it and I was like oh you are you are actually correct I feel like Huawei and Samsung and pretty much everyone especially Google and Huawei because of all the AI stuff are really, you know, the, the images sometimes feel a little over tweaked, especially oh, yeah. when you go pixel peeping. Yep. And, and Richard was like, you know, I'm kind of of the school where I would prefer the one plus 60 in many cases, especially when there's enough light, because there's, you know, you don't have all this AI, you know, meddling going on and you can right. see it when you pixel peep. And I'm like, but who pixel peeps, right? Like, that's the question nowadays. No one does. No I mean, one does. Not like no one in, like, like a regular consumer, they no, probably won't. that's what I'm talking about. Just... When I say no one, I mean, right, like, yeah. So, so I think it's interesting, but, but he made a good point because, you know, he, he did some comparisons, some A-B testing to like by putting on Twitter, like polls, you know, like, like, like blind this tests. photo, this yeah. photo, tell me what you think. And it was like, a lot of it was OnePlus versus Mate 20 Pro, OnePlus 6T. And and uh, I personally like both, but when we when he did a pixel peep, you could tell like the, the 6T was actually better, and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So I think there's something to be said there. Um, ultimately, for me, it's about creativity and versatility, right. and that's why it brings me back to the Huawei phones mostly, mm-hmm. and, and to some extent the Galaxies and the LG phones. I've been a huge fan of LG. Um, we haven't given enough credit to LG for starting this wide, ultra oh, wide oh, yes. angle revolution. Was it the G5? Was that it was the, the G5 one? that was the first one. And, and, uh, and, no, 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 was it? no. Oh, it no. was the V10, the no, V20. Oh, V20. V20 oh. and then the G5 or the G5 and then the V20. I can't remember which order yeah. it happened. But around that time frame, two, yeah. two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Two, three years ago because it was G8 now. Holy crap, Daniel. <laughs> We're getting old. Uh, <laughs> so, so to me, the wide angle, the ultra wide angle thing, could, I, I actually feel that LG doesn't get the credit they deserve for the I imaging agree. stuff they do. What? Like, I really am so mad about the V40 because who, in, and that's because, you know, as a consultant, I do a lot of marketing and PR related type work. And I advise companies on like when and how to launch products. And I'm like, when I saw how and when they launched a V40, I'm like, are you absolutely out of your mind launching your flagship of the year at the beginning of this mad techtober phone apocalypse month? Oh, yeah. Because you're going to be forgotten by the end of it, uh, especially exactly, when yeah. you know that it ends with Huawei and OnePlus, like basically, right? Mm. And you've got Google in the middle of all that. Like you, you're going to get slaughtered, yep. not because you didn't make a good phone, but because people are going to forget. And in this case, yeah, they were the first phones with three lenses in the back, tele, ultra wide and regular, but nobody paid attention because even though it was pretty damn good, it was superseded by the Mate 20 Pro like two or three weeks later. And then Google threw the 
the the the Pixel Three and Pixel Three XL in the mix with uh, you know the new night mode, night sight yeah. or whatever it's and, called, and the front facing wide, and the front facing wide yep. that that you know they also have, and yep. it's like oh my god, <laughs> LG, like why didn't you just wait till December or something? Right. And and you could also have tweaked the software and improved it and everything. Oh, I, I feel bad. And now they've launched both their devices for the year, the V50 and the G8 on the same the same announcement at MWC. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm looking forward to these phones. I want them. I'm excited about them. But I'm just like, it's like a series of bad decisions there, marketing. <laughs> like, seriously. I mean, I the G4, when it came out, just to me, you know, like, how the P20 last year, P20 Pro particularly, like really like cranked things up to 11. Like so it was like a huge leap forward, just like the Pixel 2 was a leap forward. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. I felt that the, the, the G4, like four years ago, was a leap forward. It, it, had, an, it, it had the fastest f-stop at the time, 1.6, I believe. It had a really good sensor in low light. It was really spectacular. The G5 didn't really improve on that, but it had the ultra wide angle. And it was janky because it was modular and it was like, oh, oh yeah, really I that remember great. that. Yeah. The G6, I thought, was a great phone, especially the first to bring 189 display. Uh, really great idea. And then we went to the G7, which I thought was pretty solid last year. Um, the V30 and V35 were pretty great. V30 Plus or whatever it was called. And we got the V40. And I think the V40 really, to me, was. My third pick for phones last year, uh, number three, and because I feel like it just, it's one of those phones that just didn't get the credit, period. Like, it just mattered, but nobody noticed. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so sad. <laughs> anyway, we should probably wrap it up. I kind of want you to tell the world where they can find you on the internet, your personal stuff and your work stuff. Um, so, yeah, just head on to, head on over to boardatwork.com or even on YouTube. And for me, I'm just under my full name, so it's not. I'm not that hard to find. Ah, uh, Daniel Sin. Yes, as that's your Twitter, Instagram as well. Yeah, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube as well. So. Fantastic. Oh, you have your own YouTube channel too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I did things. not know that. I'm gonna go and subscribe <laughs> to that little. That's great. More stuff to watch. Awesome. Well, you know where to find me, folks. At Tank Girl on Twitter and Instagram. That's like Tank Girl, the comic book, but drop the vowels. T N K G R L. Uh, I need to post more on Instagram. I've taken a bit of a break. I don't know why, but uh, I'm hoping that this this week you'll see more P30 stuff and P30 yep. Pro, so stay tuned. And then uh, by the time you get this show, you'll definitely see it. Um, and then uh, Twitter is more kind of like, you know, uh, if you want to keep up to date on what's going on in terms of podcasts or whatever. Uh, and then, of course, uh, my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Miriam Joar, my full name spelled out. Uh, if you don't know how to spell it, go to my Twitter. It's right there. You can copy and paste it. Um, you'll find some videos there that kind of um, add content, add, uh, you know, some visuals to the podcast since it's an audio podcast. If you want to see like my unboxing of my Galaxy S10 Plus, uh, that's where you're going to find it. If you see my hands-on of the P30, P30 Pro, that's where it's going to be. Um, so, you know, my videos are not nearly a po- as polished as Daniel's. <laughs> like, I just want you to know, don't go in there expecting <laughs> a board at work level quality, but I, I'm a soloist and I, I don't like to edit very much. So I spend very little time editing and you, I, you see that, uh, but I, I, it's fine. I, and then, uh, of course, you know, like the videos on the channel, subscribe to the channel, but most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. So mobiletechpodcast.com is where it lives. It's also on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Overcast, TuneIn Radio, everywhere. Uh, good podcasts are found. Uh, tell your friends. Let's make this grow together. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. I want to thank our sponsor, audible.com. Audible is really the place to go for audiobooks. If you love books, but you can't read them on a Kindle or on paper, maybe you're driving all day or something. Uh, you know, get an Audible subscription because you're going to get tons of selection and a lot of books are read by the authors, which I really love. Uh, so you get that nice voice to go with that that book. And um, there is a special deal uh, in the show notes below where you'll find the link to my YouTube videos as well. And it's to get a 30-day free trial uh, that will support the podcast. So if you click through that link, not only are you getting a deal, but you're also supporting the podcast audibletrial.com slash mobile tech is the URL in case you're listening right now and you want to type it in. It's audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. Uh, thanks, Audible, for being a longtime sponsor. 
And stay tuned, folks. We're going to have a lot more coverage on the P30 and P30 Pro coming up in the next few weeks as we get devices, as I get folks on, like hopefully, as I mentioned, Steve Litchfield. And Daniel, thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, no problem. All right, folks, stay tuned for more. Cheers. This has been the Mobile Tech Podcast with Tank Girl, proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com.